Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel. My name is Victoria, you can call me Vic. And I'm so excited because it is finally 2024, meaning that I get to tell you about my favorite and my not so favorite books that I read in 2023. Starting with my favorites, I'm actually going to start with one that was such a surprise for me. When I picked up this book, it was only because of the edges, because of the sprayed edges. That's the only reason, which I know nothing about the publishing industry, but I can say as a consumer, if you spray the edges on your book, I'm going to buy it. I don't care what the genre is. I don't care what the book is about, who the author is. I'm going to buy it because it's pretty. I had good luck with this one because this was one of my absolute favorite books that I read in 2023. Assistant to the Villain by Hannah Nicole Marer or Marer. I thought this was going to be just your average fantasy book. Didn't really have high expectations for it. Didn't really hear a lot about it. This book actually brought me out of a book slump. I spent all night reading it. I finished it in one day and it really just rekindled that love for reading and reminded me why I love fantasy so much. So even though I went in definitely thinking this was going to be an average fantasy book, it ended up being one of my absolute favorites. I didn't realize that it was the first book in a series when I picked it up, but it is the first book and I'm so, so ready for the next books in the series to come out. In this book, we are following Evie Sage, our main character, who is struggling desperately to find a job to take care of her family. Her dad is sick and she has a younger sister that she has to take care of and she's having a really hard time finding a job and keeping a job. But lucky or unlucky for her, she runs into the villain, the bad guy that everyone in her land is scared of, but he does offer her a job and of course she can't refuse. It comes with really good benefits, really good pay, and it just so happens that the villain is hot. <laughs> it does take some time to get used to all the severed heads and the villain's temper tantrums, but she comes to find her place. One day she realizes that someone working for the villain has betrayed him and is writing out his every move. Now she has to not only resist her boss's evil charms, but also try to find the rat before he ruins her boss's plans. And when I tell you this is such a good book, I was screaming. I was giggling. I was kicking my feet. And I know when people say a book is funny or a book is cute and it made them feel emotions, usually you're feeling the emotion inside, but your face stays the same. No, this book had me grinning and blushing and like making me question who I was and what I was doing because I had such strong reactions to the dynamics in this book. Our main character is hilarious and adorable and the tension and the yearning and the relationship is so so good. I will say this is a really good fantasy book but it is not a complex fantasy book. It's not going to be super political or a lot of things to understand about the world that you're in. It's almost like a fairy tale setting with this like dynamic taking place. It is so easy to read and it went by so fast. I literally finished it in one sitting. It was so so good and I highly highly recommend it. If you're in a book slump or you're wanting to read a cute fantasy romance or just something that will give you emotion, give you life, I would recommend this book 100%. It is so cute and honestly not talked about enough. I have not heard enough people mention this book, but definitely read it. And of course, this next book is probably not a surprise to most people, but it's Fourth Wing. I waited the longest time to read Fourth Wing. I actually have owned this book for quite a while, but I didn't read it until mid this year because because of all the hype around it. If I'm being honest, I'm one of those people that the more hyped a book is, the less I want to read it because I'm so worried about being let down. But I absolutely adored Fourth Wing. It's one of those books that made me remember what it felt like to read Akatar for the first time, to be so swept up in a story that I didn't notice how long the book was or how much time had passed. And that is exactly what Fourth Wing gave me. I was really swept into the story and just loved every single moment of it. I know so many people have already heard about this. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on Fourth Wing, but in Fourth Wing, we're following 20 year old Violet Sorengale who has expected her entire life to enter the scribe quadrant where she would work as a scribe, be in the archives, in the library, noting things down, doing a lot of studying. But at the last moment, her mom forces her to join the writer's quadrant instead where she will train to become a dragon rider and fight for the kingdom of Navarre. But unfortunately for Violet, she's not prepared to be a writer or to be one of the initiates. It is extremely dangerous. People die constantly and very few make it to writer status. Life is especially difficult as a first year writer where not only are your fellow trainees out to get you, but the dragons are keeping an eye out for weakness and willing to kill anyone that they deem as too weak or as flawed and unacceptable. Again, I won't go too much into this, but it is a very, very good book. I also enjoyed the sequel, which came out this past year as well, and I highly recommend it. Uh, it is a little bit of a thicker book to get through, but I don't consider it too difficult of a fantasy book, and the romance in this book is so, so good. It is just 
Next up is kind of an odd book for me to mention. When I first read this book, I think I gave it a four star or a 4.25 stars, but it has stayed in my head this entire year and every time I've heard someone mention it, it just makes me want to talk about this book because I enjoyed it so much. It's a literary fiction, but it's it's so hard to describe. I just need you to hear me out on this and trust that it is such a good book. And that is Shark Heart, A Love Story by Emily Habeck. And if you have heard of this book, then you probably think it's weird. And honestly, it was a little weird to read, but the metaphors in this book are just unbeatable. It is such a beautiful story. And I find myself thinking back to this book all the time. So while initially when I read this book, I gave it like a 4.25 stars. Now I feel like it's one of my favorite books that I read. It's one of the more impactful books that I read in 2023. So I have to mention it. In Shark Heart, we're following this newlywed couple, Lewis and Ren, and they're deeply in love. And although they're opposites, life seems so happy for them until they realize that Lewis is turning into a great white shark. In this world, it's kind of normal. There's these illnesses that cause people to turn into animals and it's kind of normal. I would say it's the equivalent of Alzheimer's in our world. Not everyone gets it, but some people do get it and it's a devastating sentence for the people when they do because not only are they physically turning into those animals, but they're mentally turning into those animals as well. For Lewis, since he's turning into a great white shark, he starts to crave raw meat. He gets more aggressive, more unpredictable, and the disease continues until they have to be either killed or released into the wild. This story just kind of follows them as they're learning to cope. We get multiple points of views and multiple different writing styles throughout this book. We see Ren trying to cope with losing her husband after only having him with her for a short period of time and kind of having her call back to the moments of her losing her mom to the same disease as well. And then we also get Lewis's point of view as he's having to cope with him losing his life. Even though he feels like everything is fine in the moment, we kind of see him go through this mental journey as he slowly starts to lose function of his body and he starts to change and he realizes he's actually losing his mind and turning into a great white shark and it is such a beautiful story but a heartbreaking story and the metaphors are just it's unbeatable it is just I absolutely adore this book. The way that it talks about the role of a caretaker when you have someone that is sick in your life that you're having to care for and the way that other people view your relationship or look at people that have illnesses that are maybe more aggressive that they can't control. It's just it's such a good book. I honestly highly recommend it. It does come off as really weird since he is turning into a great white shark, but this story is just unbeatable and I think about it all the time. So highly recommend it, but it is a dark book, a very emotional book. So if you're wanting something that's very easy to read, very happy and light, this wouldn't be it. But if you're willing to go on the emotional roller coaster and really get deep in your feelings, then I think this would be the perfect book to read. It is absolutely one of my favorites. The next book on my favorites list is Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Cañas. This book is very unique for me because this is a horror romance. And I feel like those two genres don't tend to mix together very often, but I adored this book. I feel like this book had a really unique take on monsters and on vampires definitely not what you would typically think of when you think of vampire and just the way that it handles the monsters in this story I just I loved it in this book we are following two main characters Nestor and Nana and they are in love but they have different social standings this book does take place during Mexico and the 1800s during the Mexican-American War and Nana is the daughter of this rich land owning family while Nestor is the grandson of one of the workers that works under Nana's family so Nana is kind of considered more higher class than Nestor but they love each other nonetheless even though neither one of their families really care for them to be together in the beginning of this book we follow Nana and Nestor as they sneak out in the middle of the night to go discover treasure. Nestor thinks that if he can find treasure, he'll become wealthy enough to own land and be able to one day be with Nana when they're older. But unfortunately, instead of treasure, they end up finding a vampire who attacks Nana. Nestor ends up thinking that Nana has died and he runs away, consumed with guilt, thinking that it's his fault that she's gone. When in reality, Nana actually survived the attack but has no memory of what happened. And in her mind, she believes that Nestor just ran away and left her on her own for no reason. Then we flash forward a few years when they're both in their 20s and the Mexican-American War is in full throttle. Nana is determined to avoid an arranged marriage that her father is wanting to set up, so she's trained herself as a healer and wants to travel with her father's men into the war to help heal. At the same time, Nestor has been called upon to fight in his uncle's place in the war, which ends up reuniting the two lovers, but things don't go quite the way that they were wanting. Unfortunately, Nana is extremely angry at Nestor and refuses to talk to him, and Nestor is desperate to explain what happened, but knows that she won't believe him if she doesn't remember the monsters. At the same time that the 
this is all taking place. We have white settlers that are trying to colonize the area that they live on, and we have these mysterious monsters, these vampires that are making people sick. I love this book. I feel like it's not super scary. I feel like this is a horror romance, but it's more of a romance that takes place in a horror setting. I would say the romance is definitely the highlight of this book and the main focus of this book, but it just has this horror and war background that it takes place in, and I didn't know that that was something I liked, but I absolutely loved it, and I highly recommend this book. All right, next up is a mystery slash thriller, and that is Happiness Falls by Angie Kim. This one was a very unexpected book for me. I do enjoy thrillers and I do enjoy mysteries, but for some reason, most of the thrillers that I read are not five stars for me. Like there's always something missing. Like I was either able to guess the plot or I was able to guess the twist or I already knew what happened. But this book, this book kept me on my toes. I didn't know what was going on the entire book. And even at the end, I still didn't really know what was going on or what had just happened. I think this book does a really good job of not only being a thriller and exploring this mystery and the plot, but also bringing awareness to something that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but doing it in a way that it's part of the story. And after reading this book, I was Googling Angelman syndrome for like hours. I was so interested because it brought that awareness to me. It made me curious about it. And I just, I love this book so, so much. In this book, we are following our main character Mia and her family as they deal with their father being missing. Their father went out to a park with their younger brother Eugene but Eugene was the only one that came back and he was bloody and covered in dirt but unfortunately for them Eugene has Engelman syndrome or Angelman syndrome and he's unable to talk so even though Eugene knows exactly what happened to their father including where he might be he's unable to tell them. Throughout this book we're seeing this family try to figure out if their father left on purpose or if something bad happened all the while trying to see if they can get Eugene to in some way tell them what happened and explain what he saw and honestly this is just it's a crazy story so many secrets and heartbreak and just shocks the plot twist was I did not expect it at all and the way that this book leaves you reeling and just unsure of what you read and if the truth you've been given is the real truth or not is insane. I just absolutely loved this book and I would say it's probably one of my all-time favorite thrillers just because I think it's one of the only thrillers that I've been able to give five stars. Next up is a honker of a book and that is Babel by R.F. Kuang. This book is so interesting because it's one of my favorites but it is not it's not an easy read. It's not a quick read. It is a dense book with lots of information, lots of things happening, but it is such an important book. When I finished this, I immediately thought that this is one of those books that's one day going to be required reading in English classes, and I think it should be. Like, it feels like such an important book, but it is unlike any other book that I have ever read before. A lot of people pick up Babel and they either DNF it or they hate it because they feel like it's slow and it drags on, but I honestly think that it's worth the slowness. It's worth that build up to the end because every Everything in this book feels so relevant to today. I especially love the magical system that Babel has because it's unlike any other magic system that I've ever read or seen in a movie before. And I have to admit, I'm a bit of a language nerd myself. I studied linguistics in college, so this book really called and pulled to my heartstrings because it focuses heavily on linguistics and on language. Babel is so complex in the way the magic system works and how it explores themes of racism and sexism and exploring colonialism. It's just, it's so much and that's partially why I feel like it's such a big book and such a dense book is because it does explore so much and gives you so much. I want to reread this book with a new perspective because when I initially read this I thought it was just going to be another fantasy, just a historical fantasy like any other, but it wasn't. It feels like one of those books I should be writing an essay about because of everything that's in it. I have a special place in my heart for Babel and I will always recommend it. Next up is of course one of my favorites by one of my favorite horror authors, Grady Hendrix, which is How to Sell a Haunted House. This was his 2023 new release and I have to say as I have simmered and thought about this book I think it might be my favorite Grady Hendrix book at first I struggled to say that because the beginning of this book was hard for me to get through I'm not gonna lie they have this trope of a brother and sister that bicker and fight all the time and it wasn't my favorite but I think this is one of the first horror books that has made me feel so viscerally uncomfortable I can think of only one other book that has done that before and that was The Ruins by Scott Smith and this one is a another book that did that to me. I didn't realize that I have a thing, I guess, like a fear of dolls and puppets or like the horror dolls and puppets, but this really brought that out of me because I felt so uncomfortable and low-key scared the entire time that I was reading this. Not only did this give me the fear factor that I was looking for with horror, but it also has the comedic
comedic value that Grady Hendrix always brings to his books and I think it did a really good job of exploring this metaphor of family secrets and family trauma and what's passed down through the generations and this book it's just it is very good and there is one particular scene in this book that every time I think about it makes me want to cringe because it grosses me out a little bit and it freaks me out and if they ever make this into a movie which I don't know how that would work I think I would be genuinely scared. In this book we are following brother and sister Mark and Luis as they deal with the sudden loss of both of their parents. Luis has flown in from San Francisco to help Mark with the funeral and to help with selling their parents house but they bicker a lot and they fight a lot and they don't agree on anything but what they can agree on is that their parents house is a little bit creepy especially since it's filled with hundreds of puppets and dolls that their mom has collected over the years and Louise finds that even as she's throwing away these puppets they keep popping up in different places and it feels like she's being watched at all times. Louise and Mark are then faced with not only dealing with the loss of their parents but dealing with this haunted house and all of the trauma and secrets that are buried within it. Highly 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 recommend. It is very good but very freaky. <laughs> Next up is of course Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. I feel like this book was just a brief little like flicker on my FYP on TikTok. I heard someone say that it was super super good and then other people were saying it was super super good and then I didn't hear anything about it again. I read it and this was one of my all-time favorites. Divine Rivals is a fantasy romance but I feel like it's unlike any other fantasy romance that I've read before. It kind of reads more as like a historical romance fiction kind of vibe. It's like if you were to read a historical romance set in the United States during like World War II but the war that's being fought is between two gods and there's like hints of magic throughout the world. It's so difficult to explain but that is the best way I can put it is it feels like a historical fiction but it just has little like tidbits of fantasy that are thrown in. It makes it super digestible and easy to read so if you're someone that wants to read fantasy but you struggle with the world building this would be such an easy book for you to follow along with because it's like just little hints of fantasy like sometimes I forgot that I was reading a fantasy book because it just felt like a historical fiction romance but it works so so well. In this book we're following our main character Iris as she's dealing with her brother leaving to go fight for this war between two gods. He unfortunately goes missing on the front lines and her and her mother don't know what's happened to him. Her mother starts to slide into alcoholism and she's barely present and when she is she's drunk and Iris is trying to keep her family together as well as she can and the best way that she knows to do that is by winning the columnist position at her workplace, the Oath Gazette. Unfortunately, Iris isn't the only one that's trying to get this position. She's working against her rival Roman Kid, who is just as talented of a writer as her. She's having to deal with the loss of her brother and her mother not being a stable figure in her life so she begins to write letters on her typewriter. At first she's writing letters to her brother just as an emotional release but she realizes that they start to disappear and she begins to hope that maybe the letters are somehow making their way to her brother on the front lines. But unbeknownst to Iris, the letters are actually getting sent to her rival Roman Kid, who realizes who's sending him letters and begins to anonymously send her letters back. They end up forging a bond that follows them all the way to the front lines of the war and when I tell you the story is so good. I don't know what is in Rebecca Ross's writing but it makes me emotional. It makes me care so much about the story and what's happening and I absolutely love this book. I actually just finished the sequel as well and it's a duology and I just I love these characters, I love the story, I love the world, and I just, please, if you only read one book from all of these, I would want it to be this one because it is just so good and so close to my heart and the way I feel about these characters and their relationship, like, it's just so sweet. Their relationship is just so sweet. I just... I absolutely love it. All right, and my final favorite of 2023, which is very unexpected for me, is The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. This is a historical fiction slash literary fiction, and I wasn't really expecting myself to like it. The only reason I picked up this book was because it's set in Alaska, and I don't know, at the time it just felt like something I wanted to read. I really like the imagery and the vibe and the setting of Alaska, especially when I'm thinking of like survival and snow and the forest and all the animals. And I was wanting more of like the survival-y story and I did get a survival story, but in a different way than I was expecting. In this story, we are following Lenny, who is the daughter of Ernt, who is a Vietnam War veteran who was taken as a prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. And 
Ernst is not the best person. He has a lot of PTSD, a lot of issues that he got from the war that he's not really willing to work through. He has a hard time keeping a job and has severe anger issues. But Ernst has been left this plot of land in Alaska by one of his buddies from the war and he decides to uproot his whole family, take them to Alaska and live off the grid away from the rules of society and the rules of the government where nobody can tell him what to do. Unfortunately, Ernst doesn't plan very well and he doesn't know the basics of what him and his family need to do to survive in Alaska, especially during the winter. Lenny is a little bit unsure about this move at first but she sees that this move to Alaska changes her father. He seems like a better man, a happier man and she begins to believe that maybe things are changing. Maybe he'll stop hurting her mom and maybe he'll become a nicer person. But as winter starts to fall on Alaska and the sunlight starts to disappear, Ernst starts to get worse and worse and Lenny realizes that there might be more dangers inside her home in Alaskan winter than there are outside of her home. And when I tell you this book broke my heart, it did. It, it was unexpected but it broke my heart. I started this book and I was like there for the vibes of Alaska and it gives, it gives you the vibes of Alaska. You're getting the winter and the mountains and you get all of that and then it just pulls you in in so many ways and I just cared about Lenny so much and wanted so much more for her and for the life that she had and I just, <laughs> This is such a good book and I've heard that Kristen Hanna is really good at writing historical fiction. I think her most popular book is The Nightingale. Definitely gonna read that because this book was a banger. It was so good and I would not call myself a lover necessarily of historical fiction but this was so good. I kind of want to reread it just because the winter vibes were amazing. Like this is the perfect book to read during the winter time. I just, oh. I love it, but it hurt. That is my favorites of 2023. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you're able to take some of my recommendations. If you've read any of the books that I mentioned, please let me know your thoughts down below, especially if we disagree. I love talking to people that have different tastes in books than me. If you like this video, please leave a like down below and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this or more of me in general. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!